everybody. Welcome back to the workshop. Um, I, I'm excited today to show uh, the latest build that I've done, and this is a 15th century uh, crossbow um, right here. There's a few reasons why I'm really psyched about this one. Um, first and foremost, the tiller that I used here is actually from the Modern Arm Rooster crossbow kit, the Mark I version. Um, secondly, you'll see the design of the inlays. Um, this is a, a really traditional uh, 15th century design that you'll see all over the place uh, in uh, artwork and examples of the time. Um, the third thing, which um, was actually a first for me, is um, you can see here, this is a double axle lock. It's got a little thread here. I'll show you how that works later. This is my first try at, at uh, making one of these things, and it, it works really well. Um, and then finally, I mean, back to the inlays again, this is really what kind of what I'm all about, um, doing sort of traditional um, techniques, but using modern materials. So here, instead of using bone and horn, which traditionally would have been used, I've used actually sewer fittings in PVC and ABS plastic, uh, which I cut apart and molded and so on and so forth. And I just wanted to see, would that actually work for inlays? And it does. So let's get into it. Um, talking about the design of the tiller, um, again, the uh, the crossbow kit tiller. Um, the design for this tiller, I actually um, studied a whole bunch of different crossbows, about two dozen crossbows um, that I found in a couple of books. One here is called the Horn Bogen Armbrust, um, German word, and that literally means horn bow, uh, crossbow. It's written by Holger Richter. And um, in this, there's a whole bunch of crossbows, existing crossbows, and the measurements um, that are provided in here are not just how long and how wide they are. And that's very typical when you look at museum collections and things like that. They usually don't have very detailed measurements. Well, here, there's very, very detailed measurements of all sort of points on the tiller, the cross sections, and so on. Um, and then the same thing in this book here, which is more recent. Um, this is Die Armbrust Schrecken und Schönheit, um, which means um, crossbows, um, terror and beauty. And so this is actually an exhibition ca catalog from the, um, the German History Museum that's located in uh, Berlin. And this um, exhibition was in uh, 2019. And um, so in this exhibition catalog, um, this is an amazing book, and I would highly recommend getting, well, both of these books. Um, but again, like the first book that we um, that I mentioned there, uh, the uh, dimensions and measurements of all of the, the crossbows in here are incredibly detailed. So I was able to cull from both of these books measurements, detailed measurements from about two dozen um, existing um, surviving 15th century crossbows. And from that... Um, essentially taking averages of that, and that's where this came from. So this really is an average of real existing surviving 15th century um, crossbows. So moving on now to the, uh, the inlays and the design of the inlays. Um, as I mentioned, this is a very, very typical design, and you'll see this all over the place in art from the time. Um, you'll see it in many, many of the surviving crossbows. Um, so it's got these horn lock plates here. Um, it's got bone inlays on the top and decorations uh, down the sides. And as I mentioned, I really wanted to try to see if I could do this using just readily available cheap materials. As I mentioned, sewer fittings that um, I picked up from the local uh, home improvement store. And it actually worked um, to my surprise. And I'm just really, really pleased uh, with the outcome. One of the things I found very challenging about doing uh, the inlays were specifically uh, the lock plate inlays here. Because um, frankly, I didn't actually know if they were inlays, because it's kind of hard to tell um, from looking at um, photos of the of the surviving examples, and also from the artwork. I mean, it it's really, really hard to tell. Um, so part of me thought, is it a complete cutout right back to the nut in the tiller, or is it simply scooped out in the wood um, as an inlay instead of actually replacing the wood itself? And um, I came across in the Richter book um, that I showed before, I came across a photo, um, essentially a piece of a, of, a, of a tiller, and 
all of the inlays are missing from that tiller, but of course you can see the spaces where they were supposed to be. And when you look at where the lock plates are, you can see very clearly that they are in fact inlays. And this is really interesting to me because this really highlights the, important, the importance of even fragmentary evidence when you're looking at um, objects uh, from history. Um, yes, it's great to have complete crossbows that survive from that time, um, but even bits and pieces of crossbows um, can actually teach you a lot. In fact, they can actually teach you more um, in that same book, um, which is really all about the horn and sinew prods that were more typical for this type of crossbow, um, a lot of what they know about the construction of those prods is because they have pieces of, of prods, broken prods, and so they can actually see inside and see how they're in fact constructed. And so by the same token, um, that photograph of that beat up, worm-eaten piece of uh, tiller um, showed precisely how those inlays were cut in, and specifically the ones around the lock. Now, putting those fake bone, again, ABS plastic, um, these lock plates in there was a bit of a challenge, because as you can see, they're on a curved surface. These other inlays are on flat surfaces. And in fact, I put those, the white inlays in before I even carved down the stock because it was very, very easy to just take a handheld router and route out most of the material and finish it up with a chisel. Um, but these kind of had to go in um, after um, some of the carving was already done. And I've never actually worked with horn before, but my understanding is, is that um, it can be boiled and made flexible. Um, so, for example, a lot of the bolt clips that you'll see, particularly on sort of starting in the 17th century, a lot of the bolt clips that you'll see are, in fact, made of horn that they've boiled and then formed, like molded, into the shape that they want. So, with that in mind, um, when I was trying to figure out how to get these in, um, what I realized is, well, you can warm up this plastic and mold it into shape, too. So... Once I cut these triangular um, spaces out of the tiller, and that goes in probably about, um, I'd say about an eighth of an inch or so, I had the, the inlays rough cut into the triangular shape, and then I heated them up with a heat gun and then pressed them into place to really fill out um, all, the, all the gaps and so on and so forth. And once it was cooled off and hardened, then I then... I took them off and then glued them back in again. Um, but that made me think, is that how they would have done um, the horn inlays? Would they have softened the horn first, um, pressed it into place and so on? I don't know, um, but I think it's a possibility. And this is one of the things I love about building reproductions of historical crossbows because by the act of actually doing that and puzzling through some of these uh, design and production um, issues, it kind of gives you a little bit of a window into what may have occurred. Um, obviously, keeping in mind that, you know, I'm using a lot of modern materials here too. Um, but again, the design is the same. And so finally, um, the other great thing about this one is um, I've been able to make a two-axle uh, lock. And so the way that this ax this two axle lock works um, is quite a bit different from the single axle um, lock that we've seen in some previous videos, and actually is um, the sort of default locking mechanism um, with the uh, the crossbow kit. So let's dive in and take a look at these two locking mechanisms and how they differ, and also what advantage um, the double axle lock would give you. As you'll recall from previous videos, this single axle uh, lock mechanism, and the single axle referring to the axle on the trigger lever, um, is very, very simple to operate. You've got the spanned crossbow, so the string is secured here behind the, the, uh, the fingers of the nut. And so the entire weight of the draw weight is transferred uh, to the fingers here, to the nut. And this is really transferred into rotational force, because of the turning axle here. So really, all of that weight is now pushing against this end of the trigger. And as you'll recall, the way that this operates is you simply push up 
on the end of the trigger, and that releases the string. Now, the only force that the trigger is really working against here is that rotational force is creating friction between the end of the trigger and the notch in the bottom of the nut. And that's really the force that we're working against when we're operating this kind of single axle trigger mechanism. In contrast, here we have the two axle uh, trigger mechanism uh, that we're using in the crossbow that we're looking at today. One, two, and again, when we talk about the number of axles, we don't really count the rotational axle for the nut. So right away, you can see the major difference here is you've got this intervening uh, tumbler between the trigger lever and the nut. And in addition, the notch in the nut is now in the back as opposed to the bottom, like on the single um, axle trigger. And the way this works is simply the, uh, the end of the trigger engages with the bottom of the tumbler, and the nut, the notch in the back of the nut, engages with the top of the tumbler. And all that happens when you lift the end of the, uh, the trigger, it releases the whole system. So the beauty of this mechanism, as compared to the single uh, axle trigger mechanism, is that the rotational force we were talking about is no longer pushing against the end of the trigger. Instead, it's pushing against the top of the tumbler, and it's also pushing at an angle. So right away, you're going to have less friction there. And the other key importance here is by having this intervening tumbler, you're actually increasing the mechanical advantage. So you're essentially multiplying the mechanical advantage, advantage that you already have the long trigger by the mechanical advantage that's provided by the tumbler in between. Um, in this case, the top of the tumbler is slightly shorter than the bottom of the tumbler, and that is really what creates and multiplies the overall mechanical advantage, thereby making a much smoother release. Now, resetting this mechanism is obviously more complex than the simple single axle nut. So, now, what you gain from the smoothness um, of the motion when you're pulling the trigger on this uh, double axle uh, lock, um, you pay for in re recocking um, or resetting the trigger. Um, it can be a little bit fiddly. Uh, the way that's done <clears throat> is you rotate the nut back to its starting position, and then this little string here on the end is actually connected um, to that tumbler on the inside. And so you just have to reset the nut and pull on that and then that engages the lever. I'll show you again. You can see, reset the nut, pull on that, and there. You can see the trigger falls back into place and then it's ready to go. And then pulling up, releases. So that's basically it for this uh, crossbow. Um, why don't we take it outside and uh, give it a test shoot. It's really amazing to me um, how much smoother the, the trigger release is with this second axle in there. It's, it's, a, it's a huge difference, even um, compared to the lighter prod on a single axle. This is a much heavier prod. Um, so on some of the other ones I've made, like 70, 75 pounds with a single axle, um, you still have a, a little bit of a jerk. Whereas with this one, even though it's a 120, 130 pound prod, with that second axle in there, it's just such a smooth release. Um, just really, really great. So that's it for the 15th century crossbow. Um, again, super happy with how this one panned out. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, this one is actually for sale. So if you're interested, um, my email and my website are in the description below. So send me a message. And in the meantime, we will see you in the next video. Thank you.